though, too. It was not like two of you. There was two. I fixed, I fixed it. <laughs> I'm throwing my voice. Hey, everybody. My name is Emily, and I'm the community manager here at Two Diabetes, working with the Diabetes Hands Foundation. And it's our Happy Thursday live interview. And I'm so glad we have a really good audience who has joined us here on the homepage of Two Diabetes today for a really exciting talk with Dr. Denise Faustman of Faustman Lab, who is doing incredible work around seeking out the elusive cure and reversal for type 1 diabetes. Dr. Faustman, welcome. I just put the camera on you. Thank you so much for spending some time to be here with us today. Can you please start? <laughs> Can you please start by introducing yourself and telling us who you are because there may be some folks in the audience who are not yet familiar with you. Okay, so um, you already know my name. It's Dr. Denise Faustman and um, I'm sitting here in Boston and I'm on the faculty of Harvard Medical School at Mass General Hospital um, and that means that I'm both a researcher as well as a clinician. I, I got my training in endocrinology but I got my PhD in immunology and molecular biology. So the favorite thing I like doing is thinking about the basic science, but not just thinking about the basic science, but translating it um, to people who have type 1 diabetes. So I'm kind of a, a living, walking example of somebody who can translate discoveries into therapies uh, possibly for people that have this disease. That is very exciting for those of us who have this disease and are really glad that you are that you are working on it and doing that translation. So tell us sort of first off some of the background of the research that you've done around type 1 diabetes and have you have, have you seen patients? Do you see patients? Do you do lab research? What are you working on now? Okay. So um, let me talk about today and then I'll talk about like how I got to today. So uh, we have a large uh, clinical translation center here at Mass General Hospital. In fact, uh, to give you the sales pitch on Mass General Hospital, it's actually the largest clinical translation um, institute in the United States right now. It has uh, something like $2 billion of research in clinical translation per year. So um, it's kind of famous for that. Um, unfortunately for you guys, it's not all on type 1 diabetes. So um, uh, luckily I'm one of the people that work on translating in type 1 diabetes. So um, yes, um, <clears throat> I do see patients, but mostly patients for uh, clinical trials and clinical translation. So I'm a board certified endocrinologist, which means means I could see people in the clinic for um, routine care, but what really excites me is seeing people uh, that want to participate in research studies. Um, so we see about 40 patients a week, you know, sometimes 10, sometimes 40 per week, who all want to be considered for future clinical trials or are in different portions of clinical trials here. So that's kind of how the week goes, and the rest of the time um, I'm writing grants and uh, working on the science behind those clinical trials. So that's uh, the generally what I do during the week. So how do we get here? Uh, that's kind of an interesting um, question. Um, so um, I thought that um, um, a number of years ago, quite a few number of years ago, um, I wanted to be an endocrinologist. And I actually wanted to be a real physician just seeing patients. But after all that training, after all my MD training, my PhD training, my postdoc training, uh, my internship, residency, and fellowship. Okay, so now you're really old and <laughs> you're still training. Um, I, I realized that when I was in the clinic, I didn't feel like I was doing anything for anybody. I really felt like, as an endocrinologist, I was like looking at people for what I call badness every day. Like, you know, do you have a problem with your eyes? Do you have a problem with your kidneys? Okay, do you have any nerve problems, you know? And I realized that for me to feel satisfied, um, I needed to try to change the field and do things that would change how we treat people and uh, really take basic science and try to um, make the big steps, not just the caretaking steps. So that's pretty much for the last 20 years put me back in the lab and in the clinic, but in the, in the form of clinical translation. So, so that's kind of um, how I got here. It was realizing that in the clinic, I didn't feel like I could help people to the degree I wanted to help them. Uh huh. 
So we already we already have a bunch of excuse me a bunch of questions in the chat room, and one of them is, what is clinical translation? Oh, okay. So that just means like. So normally people picture doctors, you go into the little room, you put your little blue gown on and they come in and they look at your meds and they take your blood pressure and that's like true clinical practice, right? Uh, they're going to order these tests, they're going to tell you that you need to do this and that and you know, you go get your blood drawn, you get the x-ray or whatever and you come back in three months, you know, in case of diabetes, you get your hemoglobin A1C check too. Um, but clinical translation means that you take something experimental that hasn't necessarily been used in the setting you're using it in before and try to do clinical trials to try to get something new to the market or something new as a new medicine, it could be a new device, a new procedure, a new way of monitoring people. You're actually trying to do the invention part and, and, and the application to people to prove it actually works in people so that more people can have access to it. Cool. And you had mentioned that you started out actually practicing medicine with, with patients and that you felt like you were looking for badness and you were yeah. not able to really help people. And uh, you and I had a brief conversation about this earlier about how um, endocrinologists have really kind of signed up for what can maybe sometimes feel like a bit of a thankless job because they don't get to cure what ails their patients. They don't ever get that satisfaction yeah. of, of having the condition be sort of over and done with and we yeah. succeed yeah. and we beat yeah. it. So, so you decided to go into working to try to really succeed and beat it, which I think is an incredible thing. And we have a lot of folks in the chat room who already know something about your current work with BCG. Let's get into discussing what that is and what your hopes are for it. Okay, so um, BCG is a vaccine, okay? And most of people probably follow your program are in North America, so they're saying, what's BCG, okay? But if you were sitting any place else on the globe, you'd go, of course, I know what BCG is. So BCG is a vaccine. It's the oldest uh, continuously administered vaccine in the history of the world, okay? And it is the most frequently administered vaccine in the history of the world. So it started being used um, almost 95 years years ago um, for its primary indication and that was to vaccinate newborns and children in preschool and elementary school to try to prevent tuberculosis. Okay, So people in the United States and Canada and um, some parts of Europe aren't familiar with it that much because in the United States and Canada um, tuberculosis is an uncommon disease. So unlike all the vaccines that you get in uh, childhood or you take your kids to get in childhood, uh, the one vaccine they don't get in this part of the world, the globe, is the BCG vaccine. So it um, has been used continuously, 100% um, um, of entire populations to try to prevent tuberculosis continuously for almost 100 years here. And then about uh, 20 years ago, uh, BCG was approved in the United States and Europe for another indication. And that other indication is at very high dose uh, for bladder cancer. Okay, so it's the number one therapy right now at extremely high doses. Uh, for people with early stage bladder cancer. So that's what BCG is, okay? Old fashioned drug, been out there forever, okay? So we like BCG uh, for a reason that's not related to tuberculosis and also um, it's not related to bladder cancer. And that's um, the reason we love this safe old fashioned drug is it's been known for about 20 years when anybody gets this vaccine, anybody, you don't have to be diabetic, anybody gets this vaccine, uh, you make an immune response to the vaccine. And the immune response you make is you elevate this hormone in your blood uh, called TNF, okay? In the immunological field, we call it um, uh, a cytokine. But for most lay people, it's kind of like a hormone. So you make that hormone. And um, we know that people with type 1 diabetes and other autoimmune diseases have um, a deficiency of that hormone. So effectively, we're using the vaccine as a surrogate to restore that hormone. Now, you may say, okay, what does this hormone do? And if I don't have enough of it, like why? So, so that um, was a discovery that was about uh, 20 years in the making. So 
for those of you who watch science shows on TV, um, it's really not the eureka moment. You know, there's a few eureka moments in your lab career, but most of them are not. Most of them are a long flog, okay? But anyways, it was a long flog, and um, we found out that, um, as other people had, that there's bad T cells in your blood, bad white blood cells. Um, and what we discovered first in the mouse and then in the human was that these bad T cells uh, die. Uh, when they see TNF and that because you don't have enough TNF you have too many bad T cells and what we and others have also discovered is there's actually a good population of T cells called T regs it sounds like a dinosaur you'll never forget the name but they're the good guys the T regs yes yeah, the little dinosaurs in your blood no just kidding so anyways they're the they're the good cells and um, uh, those cells uh, multiply when they see TNF and then a third thing happens with elevating TNF that was really unexpected uh, when we did the first mouse experiments about 12 years ago is that when we killed off the bad T cells and we induced the good T cells, uh, the pancreas regenerated. And what was remarkable was not only that discovery that the pancreas regenerated once the disease was removed, but these were mice at first um, that were end stage mice. So that was the first data that you could actually do an immune intervention in mice that were near the end of their disease, not just pre-diabetic mice, because most things work in pre-diabetic mice. And a few things work in new onset diabetic mice. But what propelled us was not only this discovery that um, NOD mice had too little TNF and that we could cure them, but people. Um, hundreds and thousands of people we've studied have the same uh, defect in too little TNF. So that's why we're moving this chief generic drug forward um, to try to elevate TNF. Um, so we're using this very safe therapy that's been talk about safety record, okay? You can't buy anything even over the counter in your pharmacy with um, such an impeccable safety record, let alone buy any uh, uh, prescription in the pharmacy that has a hundred year safety record on it. Um, so um, we love it because it's safe, it's well known, it's cheap, and we think we can use it as a surrogate to giving TNF itself. So that's that's kind of maybe too much detail at this point, but that's kind of the big picture. Well, I want a, just actually a little bit more detail. First off, you mentioned end stage mice, and that yeah. means that they have had diabetes for, for how long? Yeah, weeks and months, okay? And so uh, that translates into our trials because here at Mass General Hospital we're doing the first immune intervention trials in the world in people with the disease, long term with the disease. The phase one trials were done with people 15 to 20 years out with type 1 diabetes. So if you go to clinicaltrials.gov and you look at all the immune intervention trials, you'll see that you know, uh, you're know you a candidate if you got diabetes yesterday and you're a candidate if you got it a week ago and you're a candidate if you got a month ago, maybe. But if you've had it a year or two years, let alone 15 or 20 years, you're kind of off that list. So these are the first trials in the world trying to intervene with an immune intervention other than like total body irradiation or something like that um, um, with people with longstanding uh, disease. Mm -hmm. So we have a, a member in our chat room whose handle is Bagpipe Girl who is asking exactly the question that came to my mind. Um, as you were explaining this process, which is how does how does all of this relate to the autoimmune response that will happen in people who have type one diabetes? Even even if we can get the pancreas to regenerate, won't that response still bring the diabetes back? Oh yeah, so that's the whole secret here. Okay, so that's the background of this project. Okay, so when I first came to Harvard here, I was um, responsible for setting up. Uh, the first islet transplant program outside of St. Louis because I had trained with a guy named Paul Lacey who had developed islet isolation technology. So Harvard uh, did not want to not have what the Midwest had. So I got recruited here right out of med school to set up that program. And so we rapidly learned, this was like 1987 or so, in trials and nobody wanted to listen to this data. This is like data nobody wanted to hear um, 20 years ago, um, we decided to transplant islets in people who were going to get immunosuppression, right? They were going to get a kidney. So let's just piggyback on and put the islets in. 
And so we did that for like five years and um, learned in humans really fast that even people with 20 years of diabetes, 30 years of diabetes, even with immunosuppression, bumped off the islets immediately. So that was the lesson. So that's a clinical translation lesson that pushed me back in the lab for the 20 years to work on the autoimmunity. So we knew this big, bad, dirty secret that you, it didn't matter who had the bigger vat of islets or who could get more pancreases or more recently who could get more stem cells. That was an irrelevant question. The real big nasty question um, that's hard to deal with was the original disease. You hadn't got rid of the original disease and guess what? It lasted there for decades. So that's what BCG attacks. It attacks the original disease process to take it away. Um, and then um, um, it unleashes the pancreas to self-heal, more or less, uh, so that you have restored insulin secretion. So that's how we discovered the regeneration. It was taking away, in a very targeted way, the bad T cells to unleash uh, unleash the regeneration. But the question's right on target. If you just induce regeneration and you don't do anything to the T-cell compartment, you're putting wood on a fire and wondering why it's burning. I mean, it's it's uh, it's it's not going to work, okay? So we know that. Mm -hmm. So can you explain a little bit more about what exactly the bad T-cells and the good T-regs mm -hmm. do? Yeah, we should really name the bad T cells something other yeah, than right. bad T cells. Okay, so in doctor talk, you know, they're patho uh, pathogenic CD8 T cells, you know, uh, that are autoreactive to a given epitope. So we can talk that way, but I just like bad T cells and good T cells. So um, for us, most of the bad T cells are CD8 T cells. Okay. And people from around the world the last 10 years have done a really good job at um, identifying what they react with, what parts of the islet they react with, and how they kill the insulin-secreting islets. Um, so they come in many different forms. It's not just a single clone of bad CD8 T cells. It's not just one, one bad cell that then proliferated up. There's all sorts of... Um, bad T cells in the repertoire of people with type 1 diabetes. And luckily, TNF doesn't care whether it's to a phosphate epitope on it or it's to an insulin epitope or whatever. It's equally effective at killing different populations of autoreactive T cells. So we have um, several people in the chat room have already asked, so you've, you've done a bunch of research in mice and are seeing some really good results. What are what are the hopes for translation into humans? Um, oh, okay. So we're already yeah. So we talked about mice, but uh, we're already through phase one clinical trials. Okay, uh, those took us about five years to do, and we're actually in phase two clinical trials. So this is no longer a silly little mouse project. Um, so, uh, uh, as we often say, we've made the mouse community really happy. Now the question is, can we make the diabetic human community equally happy? Absolutely. Um, so we don't even own a mouse in the lab anymore. A lot of people come to visit and they want to see the mice, and we don't own a mouse anymore. So uh, right. all the experiments we do are totally on humans. So that was a huge transition about seven, eight years ago. Um, it's always scary as a researcher, as you can imagine. You find something really promising in a mouse, and uh, probably one of the hardest um, segues is to say, am I brave enough to now look at diabetic blood to see if it's there? Because what happens if you do 10 years of wonderful mouse data, and then you go to the human and you don't see it? Do you, do you really want to do that human preclinical work. So uh, we were brave and we did that and um, started seeing in culture first that humans had the same bad T cells that died with TNF and humans um, also in culture um, you could isolate the CD4 cells and uh, with TNF induce uh, the good guys, the Treg cells. So we did all that homework before we ever went into a human clinical trial because we didn't want to conduct a trial blindly without knowing humans had the same defect. And then we got done with the phase one clinical trial, and now we're screening uh, patients for uh, phase two clinical trials with repeat BCG. So if anybody's out there interested, you can just um, log on to faustmanlab.org. It's F-A-U-S-T-M-A-N uh, dot org. 
it's my last name, and my um, home page will come up, and there's a place where you can register. Um, and if you're more serious than that, you can come visit us as well. Wonderful. You know, we have a couple of people in the chat room who have actually given blood to your to your uh, to your research to the Faustman Lab, and so they're excited to be hearing about sort of the progress of things. And one of those people whose name whose handle on two diabetes is Brunetta is asking if the current phase two trial is going to develop um, an algorithm for BCG dosing in humans, and if so, what factors will be used to determine that dosing? Okay, so in fact, um, two of your followers uh, were actually in my lab this morning, um, and uh, they they already knew that I was going to be on the show at two, so <laughs> they came in. Um, but you know, they asked the same question because I guess you know, if you're diabetic, you're used to doing this, right? And you're used to doing this, and you're used to doing it many times a day, okay? So they kind of wanted an indication of, like, are you going to give BCG 12 times a day? Are you going to give it once a day? Are you going to give it once a month? So um, we hope to figure that out in the phase two, but if I had to guess or give you an impression, um, you know, for vaccinations, we're thinking, you know, every year, every six months, every five years. So this is a whole different, um, diabetics are not scared of needles, this is a whole different kind of vaccination program. Um, um, and we also hope, I mean, certainly everybody who's diabetic knows it's the most um, self-care and self-management disease probably in the world, okay? Um, and um, you guys know more about your diabetes than we know about your diabetes because it's so self-managed and monitored. But we hope that that... Um, uh, those kinetics, those, those really tough kinetics of giving insulin and checking blood sugars are not mirrored by BCG. So um, can we find patients that are going to be unresponsive? Can we find patients that are going to need it every year? Can we find patients that are going to need it every five years? Um, that's what we hope to define a little better um, in phase two. Um, we haven't, we have not yet seen variability, at least in the in vitro assays or in the phase one, in the prevalence of these defects. So um, this is what we call a phenotype. You know, we're taking CD8 cells and culture and putting the drug on them and seeing the bad guys only die. We haven't ever identified a classic type one patient who did not have that defect. So we um, presume that in phase two, the majority of the people will be uh, responders. The question in phase two is, uh, how far can we push the dosing to um, change things like hemoglobin A1C or total insulin administered or pancreas regeneration? So um, we hope not to have a therapy that is only applicable to a small number of people. Mm -hmm. We haven't seen that. You, you mentioned a, a classic, classic type 1 diabetes. So actually a while ago in the chat room, our, our member, One Happy Diabetic, was asking since since diabetes can present itself in so many different ways and we're recognizing more and more that there are lots of different kinds of diabetes, um, even within sort of the general category of type 1, does that, does that mean that this treatment might work differently for people who have different kinds of type 1 diabetes? And when you say classic type 1, what, what is that? How, how do you yeah. define that? Okay, so that's a whole bunch of questions. So, how we define, well, let me talk about where the exceptions would be. If, if you get diabetes that's type 2, let's say you're overweight, you're not exercising, and for years you have high insulin levels, and then eventually you have low insulin levels, um, and you have no other autoimmune disease, and um, you need huge doses of insulin, that's probably pretty much classic, you know, type 2 diabetes. But if you have autoantibodies and you got the disease anywhere from the age of 2 to the age of 40, and some people can go up to 45, um, and you have the right HLA type, we see these defects in those people. I think where we won't see the defects are these um, cases of, and we haven't looked at many of these cases, of what's called monogenic diabetes. You know, it's diabetes that people get when they're 6 months old or eight months old. That may be a different disease than what we're talking about. It certainly is a different disease and, and probably it's not going to be responsive to BCG. 
But there's a lot of people with type 1 diabetes, as we define it, with autoantibodies, autoreactive T cells that we can detect, um, insulin dependence, uh, history of ketones, usually another autoimmune disease like hypothyroidism or celiac, that get at the age of 40, and we think those uh, people would be excellent candidates uh, for this drug. But if you're 50 and you're, you know, 20% overweight, you have no history of autoimmunity, and um, um, you really look like insulin resistance, uh, this will probably not help you. Okay. So. It's, so this is probably also not something that will be useful for people with type 2 diabetes? That's correct. So where we think the usefulness of this will be is in autoimmunity in general. And um, so what's happened over the last 10 years is truly remarkable. So we were kind of um, isolated on this concept 10 years ago that you needed to add TNF, okay? That was kind of counterintuitive. Uh, but the rest of the world working on autoimmunity is kind of caught up on that. In fact, some of the genetic polymorphisms, the genetics behind this of why you need more TNF are being defined even faster in other autoimmune diseases. It's moving so fast now that uh, we put together a working group in Europe last year of all the clinical trials now ongoing in BCG in autoimmunity. So the most advanced, and they're showing um, incredible efficacy of BCG and autoimmunity, the most advanced clinical trials right now are actually in Europe in multiple sclerosis, another autoimmune disease. They're um, not in phase two trials, they're in phase three clinical trials. Um, and in phase two clinical trials in the type of multiple sclerosis they're studying, uh, BCG added on to the standard of therapy is uh, significantly better even at five years out for uh, preventing clinical relapses. So the data is very dramatic now in the human populations. Uh, there is data out of Turkey showing three vaccines uh, prevents uh, type 1 diabetes versus zero vaccines or one vaccines. There's now large clinical trials in Denmark uh, of reinstating BCG in neonates to try to prevent allergies um, and autoimmunity. And now there's trials in Australia as well uh, reinstating BCG. So the field, um, although we had our little ideas moving along, we kept um, probably shunned the idea of using a 100-year-old drug. It, it wasn't snazzy enough. We should have just renamed it. Um, uh, that has uh, really changed, and so if you look at our website, we uh, put all the data together. It's really science geeky data, but we published a book, um, and um, I'm surprised the number of lay people are buying the book. It's about $20, um, and, um, but some lay people have given me feedback back that I need to do the English translation now of the book. Um, which we haven't had time to do. But the exciting thing is um, that um, not everybody did the 20-year flog like we did of why you need BCG and why you need more TNF. But there's um, equally um, strong literature showing that as people become um, um, more in, in higher economic status, um, the rate of allergies and uh, autoimmunity goes way up. And there's um, the data that's very complementary to ours is that um, a lot of moms always think it's the kids' vaccines that cause the disease. And that's probably not directly the case. But every time you get infected with mono or you get infected, let's say, with mumps or measles, you make the normal TNF response. So if you're living in a very high economic culture where um, every time your kid gets sick, uh, they get antibiotics in six hours, and every time your kid uh, needs to have prevention of bumps, measles, um, rubella, smallpox, they no longer get those exposures to natural disease that elevate TNF. You could say the vaccines cause the autoimmunity. So how some people view this program from more of a California viewpoint, not from a signaling cell viewpoint is what we're reintroducing is a really safe infection that will elevate TNF to do what should have probably happened with uh, normal immune exposures through childhood. So that's the other way to view this. We're just re restoring the normal uh, way that you elevate your own TNF when you get infections. Wow. 
we have a whole lot of questions out of everything that you just said, Dr. Faustman. So such incredible stuff. One of the questions, um, again by one happy diabetic, is given that BCG is not used currently in the United States, but is more commonly used in other parts of the world. Is there any correlation to lower rates of type 1 diabetes in places where it is used? Yeah. So um, there is a huge amount of epidemiology data. And I always laugh at epidemiology data because um, if you listen to NPR in the morning, you know, one, one morning you get out of bed and if you have a glass of red wine, you'll never have a heart attack. And the next morning, if you, you know, you know, it goes on and on. So, you know, if you look hard enough, you know, you'll find associations. Well, um, keep in mind, so the strongest data in support of that, that question is the fact that um, BCG is really the, uh, the benign form of tuberculosis, right? It's the form of tuberculosis that um, infects cows, not humans, okay? So what we're really in introducing is a benign form of uh, non-pathogenic uh, tuberculosis, okay? And so if you look at the global data uh, for multiple sclerosis or type 1 diabetes, for parts of the world where there's endemic uh, tuberculosis, you never get allergies and you never get autoimmunity. So those are just like incredible statistical curves to like the fifth and sixth decimal point. So there's no doubt that getting tuberculosis protects you from getting autoimmunity. Okay, and there were, in fact, almost 30 years ago, studies in Denmark. There's a published paper from almost 30 years ago of a study in Denmark following 200,000 subjects. Okay, so not a small study, a huge study. And they could show that um, exposure to tuberculosis before the age of 12 um, totally prevented the incidence of multiple sclerosis in that country. So you don't want to get infected uh, with tuberculosis. So this is kind of um, uh, the benign way to do that, to restore the immune balance. So some people have um, put this program in a different perspective. People know that in parts of Africa, exposure to malaria is protective, okay? And if you have a certain uh, type of sickle cell trait, uh, you never get the disease and you're protected from other diseases. So it could well be that if, if you're into epidemiology, the concept that um, you lost all these natural infections and now we're introducing one on a certain genotype will result in a better immune balance is the other way to view this program. So yes, so in answer to our question, the actual tuberculosis bug is highly protective of autoimmunity and allergies. What about the vaccine? Um, what we now know from new data out of Turkey is um, three vaccines are highly protective of autoimmunity. Okay, highly protective of autoimmunity. Um, and that's why uh, there are studies ongoing in Denmark and Australia just starting up again on looking at allergies and autoimmunity. But um, you may need more than just one vaccine at birth. You may need like three vaccines. And in fact, the data out of Turkey shows that one vaccine at birth just doesn't protect at all. You need the three throughout childhood. So um, again, it's about dosing and how many exposures you get. So um, just getting um, the one may not be sufficient uh, for complete protection, okay? That's for prevention, yeah. So is, would it be logical to infer that if um, BCG is protective against diabetes and type 1 and can even reverse that, that it will, it's also protective against and can reverse other autoimmune conditions, uh, thereby really improving the lives of those of us who collect autoimmune <laughs> conditions? There are several of us here present who have more than just diabetes. Yeah. Um, it, would, it would be a, a cure-all. Yeah, so there's trials, um, another autoimmune disease we study, and now other people are um, in Norway as well as at NIH. There's going to be, uh, we hope, new trials starting in Sjogren's syndrome. It's kind of a lupus-like syndrome, kind of like rheumatoid arthritis, where women get uh, dry eyes and dry mouth. Uh, there's a lot of data. In fact, the genetic mutation we found for a lot of this bad T-cell education in the mouse turns out to be present in 100% of people with Sjogren's. So there's um, uh, good data suggests that this program needs to go forward in that autoimmune disease. Uh, there's a lot of data that this uh, will work in celiac uh, disease as well. 
um, and uh, those trials are planned. There's certain autoimmune diseases where I would not go into this um, with. Uh, a disease I don't understand, even though it's autoimmune, is rheumatoid arthritis. Okay. Um, why there was probably a lot of pushback in this idea is that one of the billion dollar therapies uh, for rheumatoid arthritis is anti TNF. Okay. About a third of the patients respond. So when we started getting data, you know, 15 years ago that you needed more TNF in these other sets of autoimmune diseases, uh, people were like, well, what about uh, the anti TNF therapies? Well, what's fascinating about the, so why I put RA separate is, of course, if you have a drug that works in RA, people thought, well, I'm going to march it through every other autoimmune disease. And uh, the data came out about six years ago when they started uh, taking anti-TNF into multiple sclerosis is that um, they got really bad data. So three different uh, drug companies took anti-TNF into multiple sclerosis and um, almost uniformly every single patient got new brain lesions in three months. So that data is also really supportive of what we're doing and uh, supports the concept that in MS and diabetes you need more TNF um, to do these immune modulatory effects. So you hate quoting people's bad data, but that data um, puts together this group of autoimmune diseases together as maybe a group that would benefit from more TNF. So I want to I want to get back to a little bit about the process of research because you've talked about phases one, two, and three in in clinical trials, and um, I want to make sure that people know what those what those terms mean, mm -hmm. and uh, and then I want to get into what's involved in participating in a phase two clinical trial. Can you can you just really briefly oh, give us an yeah. overview of what those terms are? Yeah. So um, generally for a new drug. Phase one trials are all about safety, okay, and toxicity. So usually they last uh, a lot longer, and you have to enroll large numbers of people because the drug is new, okay. And remember that the job of the FDA is to always look for safety, okay, not whether they can approve a drug, but is it safe in the population. So generally, you have to do pretty large uh, phase one trials. Uh, generally, you don't see an immune response or a response in a phase one. You know, it's if you do, you're lucky, but generally it's all about safety. Um, and then generally a phase two trial is when you start doing different dosing um, and larger number of patients and following them longer. Um, and usually after that, you go to a phase three clinical trial where the trial's done not just at one center but multiple centers. And again, there's a huge vigilance for looking for safety because most of these drugs are new. So our program's a little unique, as I started out today to tell you that we're working with the 100-year-old drug. Okay, it's up. So we weren't worried about safety, but in phase one, that's still the stated purpose. So we can do a smaller trial over a shorter time span and prove once again this vaccine was safe. Uh, we also saw some markers move that uh, made us very pleased, um, even uh, with very low dosing of BCG, uh, that we're encouraging to make us go into phase two. So in phase two, we'll be enrolling a lot uh, more people, you know, um, um, and maybe we'll have different stages of phase two in our um, example um, and have people with different durations of type 1 diabetes. Right now, if you look at clinicaltrials.gov, the durations are, uh, you know, the patient selection may be 10 to 20 years out from disease. So that's quite revolutionary for immune intervention trials. It's not 10 days after diabetes. It's 10 years after diabetes. If we get enough funds, then we'll start other groups within uh, uh, phase two, uh, people who are maybe 30, 40 years out from diabetes, as well as people maybe, yeah, uh, five to 10 years out. So everybody always asks us, like, why do you pick one group over another? Well, uh, people always thought everybody after about two years was the same, but we know, um, as one of your other reviewers uh, mentioned, we don't think they're necessarily that different in etiology, but the different stages of the disease may mean different dosing, et cetera. So money permitting, once we get this first group set up and moving, then we'll go uh, probably to those other groups with different durations of disease. Mm -hmm. Okay. So for folks, for folks listening who are interested in potentially participating in the in your BCG phase two trial, exactly what would that entail? Do they do they 
come yeah. to your office? Dear? How yeah, many so there's all sorts of things. So um, one thing I uh, already mentioned, um, thank you for asking, um, is to go to our webpage. So it's FaustmanLab.org. Um, and then the next thing, um, just register on that site so we have your information. We're not allowed to contact you unless you uh, contact us. Okay, so... Um, and then second is once you register, if you want to come visit us and give a tube of blood, many people come visit us and give a tube of blood. Okay, Boston's a fun city. We can give you the tourist maps. There's whale watching. There's the science center. If if we were in some other part of the country, we might have not have such a good following. But Boston is a lot of fun. Okay, and you get to do your history credits. You know, it's historic. You know. So a lot of school reports on the Bunker Hill Monument, which is like two blocks away, and a lot of diabetic um, kids have done report, uh, reports on the U.S. Constitution, which is just two blocks away on the waterfront. So a lot of opportunity for education. So people come in and give blood. Uh, we're monitoring where they are in the pancreas decay, and it helps us know a little bit um, about staging where their T cells are, et cetera. So, um, we like to have a full uh, repertoire of people at all stages, so we recommend everybody uh, at least get their information in. If their finances are fine, we, we always say don't come visit us if you're using the college fund, okay? That's just not fair to your kids, okay? It's really not fair. And if we get this through, everybody's going to benefit and it's going to be the cheap drug that finally got to the market, okay? So um, everybody will benefit, um, and it'll be, um, it's not something privileged like pancreas transplants or something like that that only a few people could get. Um, it will be uh, available for all. So that's how you have to cheer us on if you can't afford to uh, come. So um, there's an email address just for these trials where you can send us questions. We have four people that monitor emails. Um, so if you want us to critique your medical records, it's not going to happen, guys, okay? You can try, but it's not going to happen. Uh, but if you have a simple question, we try to answer it. So that email address is really easy. It's diabetes trial. So it's diabetes trial at partners.org. P-A-R-T-N-E-R-S dot org. So it's diabetes trial at partners. That has plural, partners dot org. And you can email us, and we'll also send you the registration information there. Um, some of the trials when we get into phase two could be more remote. There is a pretty huge time commitment. So um, if, you know, uh, you don't have to be live in Boston, okay? You don't have to live in Boston. Um, um, so people sometimes have the assumption that we're just drawing on Boston crowd. Um, it's anything but the Boston crowd, okay? The Boston crowd comes, but um, people come from all over the United States, a lot of Canadians actually, and then people from all over the world. So uh, we have quite a Canadian following um, um, uh, from the far north, you know? So we love meeting people from everywhere, no matter where you are um, in the world. Um, of course, if you're coming over for Europe to get BCG, that's a little harder than if you're coming from Nebraska or Kansas or Texas. Um, but um, we try to be accommodating. The phase two trials require a lot of time and effort, okay? So, um, um, you know, you have to come weekly for a number of weeks, okay? You're going to be followed for four years, okay? Because we think that um, this regeneration of the pancreas is, um, is uh, slow and chronic and progressive. So we want to capture you uh, and be able to monitor it and prove that it's actually happening. Um, but uh, people love us, and they come, and they beg to get in the trials. But everybody benefits, whether you're in the trial directly or if you're sitting at home and you got too many kids to take care of and you can't get in. <laughs> so we have folks in the chat room are wondering about the inclusion criteria for this Phase two trial. Um, are there A1C requirements, duration yeah. of diabetes requirements, C-peptide, any of yeah. that? Folks are interested, clearly. Okay. So um, uh, for this first group we're putting together, uh, we're trying to mirror what we did in phase one. In other words, if you see good data in phase one, don't change anything. Okay. There's always changes, but you go, don't change anything. So um, um, we discovered in phase one, as we developed these really sensitive assays for insulin, they're called C-peptide assays that probably most of you guys know about, uh, that the C-peptide in humans, this is pretty unbelievable, um, 
was believed to, like, you know, you were told your pancreas is dead after a year or two years. And so what we discovered in phase one, by working really hard to get better and better uh, C-peptide assays, we did that over a seven-year period, was that uh, the majority of people with type 1 diabetes um, have a slow decay of their pancreas over 10, 20 years. So that's a whole game changer. So, um, um, and it's really good news for people who have this disease. So now the question is, how do we preserve um, some of those levels? Um, there's going to be people uh, that we'll go to next, as I alluded to, um, in other subgroups of phase two who have totally decayed, but it took them 20 years to get there. So this first group we're going to be recruiting in, you have to have some C-peptide. They're micro levels, tiny, tiny, tiny levels, but we want some because that mirrors our phase one data. Um, you have to have be willing to do the time commitment. Um, you can't have a baby in the process, okay, just because for safety. Nobody wants the liability insurance of giving a vaccine when somebody is pregnant. Um, the um, indications, the counterindications, we're using the same ones for the BCG vaccine if you're getting it for tuberculosis prevention. If you're on immunosuppressive drug and have a kidney transplant, it's not going to happen. Okay, we're not, you're not going to be a candidate. If you have somebody at home in your own home that's on immunosuppressive drugs, we're not going to give you this vaccine. If you have a fever, we're not going to give you the vaccine. So it's almost the same list as when you go to your physician and you're going to get your flu vaccine. You know, they ask you all these questions. Have you had a fever the last five days? Are you on any of these drugs? So it's just that we want you kind of in a state that you're relatively healthy um, and your immune system's intact. If you have AIDS, okay, you're not going to get the vaccine. Same as if you have AIDS and you want to get the flu vaccine. Um, so it's kind of the typical vaccine list of we're not going to give you something um, that if your immune system's not intact, uh, you're not going to get that. Um, so you have to have a little C-peptide for this first group. Uh, we like people to have a little bit of autoantibodies like GAD. Okay, uh, have a little bit of autoantibodies. Uh, we're only picking people right now over the age of 18. Okay, it doesn't matter how old you are, but over the age 18, that just has to do with the recruitment of children versus adults and the consenting process. Um, it's not that we don't like kids. Okay, so to come for a visit, um, our requirement there is you're over the age of eight. Okay, so if you want to get screened and see where you are, because another trial may come along um, and you're eight years, years old or older, um, please register and come if you want to. Uh, there's a little bit of a backlog. I should tell everybody about getting an appointment in the clinic, but we try to be as accommodating as possible. And the reason we don't take kids less than eight, everybody asks me that, like, how'd you pick eight, is that um, I have an inversion, okay, it's a Faustmanism, of holding a kid down and drawing their blood, okay? I hated pediatrics. And kids le older than eight, um, understand it, okay, and they do it. You know, the parents cry and the kid puts their arm out and is more than happy to do it. But the kids know how to do it because they're so used to needles and, you know, medical interventions. But kids less than eight, you often have to hold them down. And I don't like doing it. And so since we can study a lot of people and if we're really successful, they can benefit. That's why we have a cutoff in the clinic at eight, okay? Many mothers beg me, oh, I've got the three-year-old, I've got the four-year-old, you know. It's like, come on, guys, okay, your kid's going to benefit, okay. It's not like all these other new onset trials if we've got it right. So um, so it's age eight for coming to the clinic to get screened. But for this particular segment, you have to be over 18, okay. So those are kind of the uh, major criteria. Great. So... Um this is a really great question in the in the chat room that came up a while ago, which is, do you feel like you're getting enough support, both verbally and financially, from the diabetes nonprofit communities that fund research into cures, and why or why not? Oh, that's kind of a loaded uh, question. Is yeah, some of you one. followed my work. Um, the best way to answer that question and the most diplomatic way to answer that question is everybody should be able to have their own dream, okay? And every researcher should be able to have their own dream. So if you talk to somebody next week, they may tell you their dream is islets in a baggie, right? They want to do island encapsulation, and that's their dream. 
And, and what you'll see about our group is we never criticize other people's dreams, okay? If you think islets and a baggie are going to cure type 1 diabetes, go for it, okay? If, if you think the way to do it is uh, the environment of your child, go for it. So we kind of have a fairly open attitude that um, different people have different visions of the same problem. And until you get over that finish line, everybody should have the right to um, pursue their vision. But that attitude is probably not shared by all. Some people believe their vision is the only vision and no other vision should move forward. So that's been um, a little bit of a problem for us because it is jarring to think that somebody could move forward. It's disruptive to think somebody could move forward with something really cheap. Okay, so it's and cheap and simple and safe. So you can get a lot of criticism when you don't take something and rename it and relabel it. So uh, we've been very truthful about we're using a 100-year-old safe drug. And the amazing thing is, although the U.S. is less co cost conscious on health care costs, that's not the case in Europe. So as I mentioned before, all these trials moving forward in the world with BCG and autoimmunity um, are almost all overseas in Europe and Australia. So other parts of the world um, promote generic drugs and cheaper things and cures probably more than we do in the United States. So it's a little bit of an uphill battle. It was more of an uphill battle 10 years ago when we introduced it. Now it's probably a little bit of a wonder that it's still here and it's heading into phase two. So it now represents some of the most advanced clinical trials in type 1 diabetes. So um, we know the data and we know the people and so that's what drives us. So this is um, one of the rare clinical trials going on in the world that's totally nonprofit. It's all philanthropically supported. So for phase two, um, we've raised uh, a little over 17.9 million. Our goal is 25 million. Um, and that is uh, not one drop of industrial money or for-profit money because some foundations um, um, you know, want equity in the projects and uh, that's not the case here. So um, we've stayed um, our stead, more or less, to do what we think should be done in type 1 diabetes. And um, we're totally thrilled to have uh, this working group that now meets every two years in Europe to learn from other people doing trials in autoimmunity where they are. So each of us are driven uh, maybe by different little mechanistic ideas of why they want to be there, uh, but probably outside the U.S., uh, will come uh, for the other autoimmune diseases uh, uh, faster testing of BCG than within the U.S. So uh, there's, um, um, we're just grateful that the public has supported us. You are getting a standing ovation in our chat room right now for that beautiful answer to uh, what could be a very fraught question. So thank you so much for that for that beautiful answer, and it actually dovetails really nicely into another comment and question that you got in the chat room a while ago from Lily D, who says, I admire your attitude of being open to new paradigms in medical research. As a lay person and a patient, I've often felt both surprised and frustrated at the reluctance of doctors to see beyond the current models of thinking. How do you think you came by this thinking outside the box attitude that we so appreciate? It's kind of weird, okay? It's kind of weird because, um, you know, I look at the data, and we look at the data seriously, okay? And we try to make our decisions based on the data, not the dogma. So things that we've introduced over the years are usually highly criticized uh, when they come out, highly criticized because they change uh, the paradigms we're working on. I mean, the first thing we discovered almost 20 years ago was the, the educational defect of why the CD8 cells get out. And it was a game changer for what everybody thought. And so we were kind of shocked that there was pushback. Okay, now everybody works on the pathway. Um, or, you know, when we suggested 10 years ago the pancreas could regenerate, you know, it was like, 
uh, that paper, we weren't allowed to use the word regeneration in the title. It has restore, uh, rejuvenate, um, every other R word other than reincarnation because the uh, reviewer said there's no such thing as regeneration. So we got a lot of criticism by suggesting the pancreas could regenerate. It was so obvious from the data. I mean, it was, you know, there was no islets and then there were islets, okay? It's not, it wasn't subtle. It wasn't subtle. And then when we came out with the concept that the pancreas was actually making insulin for 20 years, everybody pushed back. So it's not surprising to me that we see things. What's surprising to me is maybe the attitude of human behavior of not wanting to see new things and how slow science takes. So I think it's a little bit of a surprise every single time we come out with one of these paradigm chamber, cha uh, changes, um, uh, the pushback um, of, of, oh my God, it's new. Let's, let's you know, test it. Let's hope it's true. Let's run with it. Let's try it in our system. And uh, more the attitude of it can't be true. So maybe that's just a skepticism in every field. But um, uh, we just keep pushing forward um, and looking at the human data um, seriously and uh, finding new things. I think it's probably should be more shocking. I wrote an editorial in a journal called Diabetologia about uh, six months ago. And the title of it is, like, why were we wrong so long? Kind of going over the concept of why did we not know the pancreas could continue to make insulin for 20 years? Why did we tell every patient when they came in, your pancreas is going to be dead in a year or two years? Why did we do that? And why did, why did somebody else not pick this up or somebody else work on the biomarkers to pick this up faster, sooner? Why were we wrong so long? So... I, I think it just needs more young people in the field that are willing to push the barriers and look at the data and not be intimidated to stand up and change those rules to make a difference. It's not easy, but it's surprising sometimes the pushback you get for new ideas. Yeah. Well, again, in the chat room, people are people are asking me to thank you heartily to to let you know how much the folks who are listening in today appreciate the work that you're doing and your willingness to take some time here with us in the community today to explain what it is that you're doing so that we can help promote it and support it and potentially participate in in the trial in the current phase two trial that you're doing and potentially other trials that you have as well. And we are just about out of time, but Dr. Faustman, if you look at my coworker is sneezing in the background. Dr. Yeah, yeah. That wasn't me this time, okay? It okay. wasn't you. <laughs> That's the problem with live camera here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually in a room full of people this whole time who've been very Oh, nice I didn't notice me. that, okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here okay. with us today. You have you have really we have a lot of folks watching who are incredibly appreciative and uh, and incredibly excited about what we have learned this morning with you, and who are probably going to go visit your website www.faustmanlab.org. Yep. Org. Org. And uh, and get to know you better and support your work. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your time, too. And hello, everybody out there. <laughs> Take good care. We will be in touch. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.